I will hand it off to Manuela. Okay, so um, we have several invited talks, and it's uh, my greatest pleasure to introduce our first invited speaker. And uh, Subarao Kambapati is going to tell us about the synthesizing explaining behavior for human AI collaboration. And maybe you don't know, but Subarao and, and I have known each other in our own research since, what, 1984? So this is how far back we go. Uh, 85, 86, 87, I finished my thesis, I think, one year after, or two years after Subarao did. And we always worked on problems that involved, in fact, uh, and, uh, this problem of planning, this problem of actually experience and reuse of experience. Subarao was a distinguished career from an academic point of view, uh, besides his personal point of view, with his family, and wife and, chil and child, he has a, a distinguished career at, uh, as a, a professor at the university, as advising a lot of students, as publishing a lot of relevant uh, research to all of us in areas of planning, areas of uh, agency, areas of learning, areas of now human AI interaction. It has been a tremendous web research, a tremendous career. So if you don't know, the homework for tonight is you should Google uh, Subarao and go to his webpage to see the tremendous impact that he and his students have had in the field. Uh, Subarao was the president of, uh, of AAAI several years, a uh, couple of years ago, and uh, he has many honors that uh, you should, many best paper awards that you should all look online. So it's a real pleasure, and I was thrilled when uh, Subarao was available. It, we are very lucky to have him here. So I would like to ask you to uh, welcome Subarao Kamapati and enjoy his talk. Okay. Uh, you hear me? Uh, thank you for those kind words, Manuela. Indeed, um, I have known Manuela forever, um, although we, I hope that we are still in Middle Ages, because I'm having a midlife crisis I'll talk about in a minute. Um, uh, so I'll be talking about synthesizing explainable behavior in human AI uh, collaboration. Uh, I'm a bit of a familiar stranger to this audience. I have papers in AMAS, I care about agents, and yet this is only my third time I came to your conference. Um, and I think part of it is because I've been happy as a single agent guy. I've been single for quite a long time um, in agency at any rate. Um, and uh, so I've been working in planning um, and how does an agent actually look at different way, you know, types of environments, different kinds of uh, goals and how does how does it go and actually generate those plans, synthesize those uh, plans. Uh, so I've done a bunch of work on uh, traditional uh, planning in, as, as you increase the expressiveness of the models, uh, looking uh, expressiveness of the goals, as well as if in fact the models are incomplete, how does one do uh, planning, etc. Uh, so this is sort of what I've been doing and you know in fact there are some of those uh, planners that we have done uh, that have had uh, some impact um, on, the, on the community. So that was all well and good. Um, what happened recently is, as I said, I started having a, a mid-career um, crisis. Um, now, normally, uh, when you have a crisis of this kind, you find God, you get a Ferrari. If you're Manuela, you go to JP Morgan. Um, <laughs> I found other agents. Um, now, again, I'm talking about agents, not humans, <laughs> but, and it turns out that worse than just finding other agents, my other agent wound up being human. Uh, so I essentially have been, uh, somehow started having this craving uh, for having AI systems work with humans in the loop, uh, something that I didn't care about as I was a grad student. We always found humans to be these messy things and really 
AI is for automation. Uh, so for some reason, maybe it's Nick Bostrom or various other people who worried about AI taking over the world and killing us. Good. Um, what happened recently is, as I said, I started having uh, a mid-career um, crisis. Um, now, normally, uh, when you have a crisis of this kind, you find God, you get a Ferrari. If you're Manuela, you go to JP Morgan. Um, <laughs> I found other agents. Um, now, again, I'm talking about agents, not humans. <laughs> but And it turns out that worse than just finding other agents, my other agent wound up being human. Uh, so I essentially have been, uh, somehow started having this craving uh, for having AI systems work with humans in the loop, uh, something that I didn't care about as I was a grad student. We always found humans to be these messy things and really AI is for automation. Uh, so for some reason, maybe it's Nick Bostrom or various other people who worried about AI taking over the world and killing us. I have started having a hankering for seeing this kind of breaking news. Uh, AI helps old ladies cross the street, plays with kids, cooks food, and hangs around, sans drama. Um, much of it, unfortunately, is still fake news, and uh, because we have mostly focused on AI essentially in a competitive or adversarial scenarios, and so I've sort of been trying to evangelize um, in, in my own way um, how to get people to take human aware artificial intelligence much seriously. So, in the various kinds of bully pulpits that I had, uh, at HKI 16, we wound up having a special team of uh, human aware AI uh, with the uh, tagline that why intentionally design a dystopian future and spend time being paranoid about it. Let's get the agents to work with us rather than just keep worrying about they're going to kill us all. Um, and then, of course, uh, this has also had with, with Manuela and other people, we've also started a special track on human AI collaboration at AI2. And then um, as, a, as an advisor, as a board member at Partnership for AI, um, I sort of looked at, we, we kind of uh, if, pushed for having this thematic pillar on collaborations between people and AI systems as one of the big things that, you know, AI, um, impacts of AI on the society should be looking at. Uh, I also, as uh, last year, uh, gave a talk on um, uh, challenges of human AI systems as my, uh, my turn at uh, uh, AAAI, as, as my turn at uh, AAAI presidency. Um, now, of course, the part of that, that talk was essentially to say that uh, human aware AI really is putting humans in the loop is not supposedly cheating the problem, but is really expanding the scope of our enterprise. You care about Sally Ann test, which shows, for example, that kids as they grow, it's, it's only later uh, that they actually realize that their mental models are different from the other people's mental models. And that's when they get to lie. Uh, I don't know about you, I was extremely happy when my son told his first lie because I knew he had a brain. Uh, because he knows that his brain is different from others. And of course, if you don't care about Sian, you care about Phoebe and, um, um, and Rachel and Monica and Chandler in uh, Friends, you should go and see this thing where they talk about uh, how to manage mental models. They don't know that we know that they know we know. You have to see this particular um, thing. So anyway, I don't need to convince you guys. You are agents community. You have been looking at multi-agents um, and, and these kinds of problems for quite a long time. Um, so what I really want to do in this talk essentially is sort of look at specifically what my group has been looking at for the past five, six years sort of. Um, and uh, what, is this, what does it take for AI systems to show explainable behavior when they're working with humans in the loop. And so that's basically what my talk is going to be. And if you are looking for like a single, um, uh, a longish uh, soundbite, it's this, that to synthesize explainable behavior, AI agents need to go beyond planning with their own models of the world and take into account the mental models of the humans in the loop. And not only that, actually the mental model here is not just the goals and capabilities of the humans in the loop, 
but should include human's model of the AI agent's goals and capabilities. So there is actually a sort of a regress. Of course, the philosophers and epistemic, epistemic logic people among you are saying, why do you stop there? Why don't we go infinite regress? But I will try to show you that this two level actually gives us a quite a good set of um, 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 advantages. So um, so from the point of view of uh, you know like uh, the formal problem of planning so a single agent essentially might have a, a, a model this robot has a model of the world and then it can just use that to figure out you know how to reach its goals and so on so kind of synthesize its plans um, and then the moment there is a human in the a robot might essentially wind up having some idea of what the human's model of the world is, human's model of how to solve the task. And this can help it, for example, in assisting, in generating joint plans, in avoiding getting in the way and so on and so forth at the minimal level. And we have some work on this actually, you know, lots of, there's been a lot of work in the community, but our own work includes there's a paper in Iras as well as a paper in Amas a couple of years back, but I won't go into that part uh, as much. But I want to go to the second level regress, which winds up being very useful, uh, which is that the robot also, the human themselves, when you when the humans work with the robots, they have some expectations on the behavior of the robot. And ultimately, this expectation model winds up being the important uh, piece in making sure that what the robot does is comprehensible, interpretable, or what I would call explicable to the human in the loop. And so in general, if you do what people expect you to do, you don't have to open your mouth. A lot of us, the men in this room probably know this already. You just do what people expect you, you don't have to talk. Um, but if you sometimes doing what the human in the loop expects the robot to do might be too costly from the robot's own cost model. And, and in that particular case, uh, the robot has to provide an explanation as to why it deviated from what is expected. And one of the points that we try to make is this, this explanation winds up being reconciliation of these models uh, of what the human thinks the robot's uh, capabilities are and what the actual robot's capabilities are. And this explanation has to be provided by the robot. Uh, to the human. When I say robot, I actually can mean you know either an embodied robot or a decision support system, as I'll show you in a minute. So an AI agent. Okay. So that's basically the kind of uh, uh, direction that we are looking at. So the agenda of our, the talk um, is actually somewhat long, but we'll hopefully get through some of the important parts, um, which is uh, um, to, to basically show that conforming to human expectations will give you explicable behavior, the behavior that would make sense to the humans in the loop. And then otherwise you will be able to, you have to provide an explanation when conforming is too costly. And uh, explicability, um, the explanations then become this sort of reconciling models, the two different models, and so providing the deltas to the human such that once they make the corrections to their model, uh, the robot's behavior would be seen as optimal. Um, and if, it, if you see that this is what is expected, then you wouldn't have to be worried at all. And then finally, explicability can be traded off for explanation. In fact, these two things can be combined. So you can go halfway and then provide, um, you know, half of the explanation. Um, and then... Uh, and then in fact, these uh, you can generate self-describing behavior, self-explanatory behaviors by putting explanatory actions as part of the behavior itself. Um, and then I'll talk about how we do, again, in, in, in an area like this, essentially it's very easy to come up with theories saying what people want, uh, but really you do really want to have systematic human subject studies. So I'll tell you some of the studies that we have done uh, and that show, uh, valid validate some of our models. And then, of course, finally, um, the whole almost a third part of the talk really is a third of the talk would be how there are many different directions this basic setup of explicability and explanations uh, can be extended to handle a variety of different things, including some very recent papers. And I'll hope to kind of give you an idea of that. So that's what uh, I'm going to try and do. Uh, so, in you know, to put this in some sort of a perspective. In, in terms of the concrete uh, kind of uh, scenarios we look at, um, as I said, although I will use the word robot oftentimes because it's somewhat easier to think of robots, um, really, and, and of course they also make more interesting demos, um, 
really, I, this can be essentially either for an embodied robot, like in this kind of scenario, or a decision support system uh, where essentially you are trying to support a human uh, making, let's say, a plan. So, in fact, we have multiple projects where we support somebody who is trying to do mission planning, uh, and then the planning agent essentially tries to provide suggestions. And giving useful suggestions depends on having a model of what it is that the human is trying to do. So, in fact, this winds up being uh, very uh, connected. Uh, so, we wind up doing both of these, although many a time I'll show pictures uh, with the moving robots to keep you away. Uh, before I go into the details, let me show uh, the people whose work I'm actually really talking about. Those are my students. Um, and in particular, I would be talking about a lot of work I'll be talking about uh, as done by Tadagata, who is now at IBM Research. He just got uh, his PhD last year and, you know, he's gotten a uh, sort of an honorable mention runner-up award for best dissertation at ICAPS. Uh, Sharath, who has a whole bunch of papers in this area, I'll be talking about his stuff too, uh, and Anagha and uh, Shaili. So I just feel as if since I'm stealing their work, I should show their pictures up front to you uh, so that, you know, I, in case I run out of time, at least you know. Work. Okay. So, what I'm going to do now is essentially start talking about this explicability, how we achieve explicability and how we provide explanations first, okay. So, as I said, teaming requires, um, in addition to just having an idea of human's model, an idea of human's expectations on you, you the AI agent, okay. Uh, and that sort of allows the agent to anticipate the human's expectations and either to conform to the expectations or uh, explain its behavior in terms of those expectations. I just said that earlier. Um, so in particular, a robot's task model might differ from the human's expectation of what the robot is actually capable of doing, what its uh, metrics are. Um, and in that case, the plans that the behaviors that are optimal with respect to the AI agent, uh, the robot, may actually not be what the human expects. That's where there is a mis uh, misalignment and people are surprised, you know, why are you doing this? So in those cases, you get essentially inexplicable plans, inexplicable behavior. Um, and when you have that, of course, the robot has two options. One is, as I mentioned, explicable planning. Sacrifice optimality in your own model just so that the human in the loop feels that you are doing what you are expected to do. So sometimes this is basically doing what people expect you to do. Um, for that, of course, you need to have an understanding of the, what human's expectations of your model are. Um, and then the other part, of course, is to don't do that sacrifice uh, because it might be too costly. Instead, you do what is best for you, but then provide an explanation as to why, in what ways the human's expectations on you have to change such that your uh, behavior would be seen again as optimal. Um, now, I will be talking about models a lot. I'm coming from planning community, so by default, I will be looking at uh, actions with preconditions and FX models. I will talk later on about the fact that the general ideas are essentially transferable to other kinds of action models, including MDPs. There are papers coming up and in each guy this year that will show that these ideas work there too. But I will specifically look at in some of the examples that I'm looking at. I'll be looking at these kinds of uh, you know actions and preconditions and so on. Um, so, in this particular case, since, since this is going to show up a couple of times, you know, it turned out uh, that um, this sort of shows that the robot essentially, this fetch robot, for those of you who have it, um, if it needs to move from one place to other, it better crouch its hand because otherwise it loses its balance 
as we found out, um, you know, to our consternation, it will just fall down because of the center of gravity falling out. And, and so, in the, for the humans, basically, if you say, go from somewhere to other place, you expect the robot to just move. Instead, you see the robot doing all these contorted motions, essentially, before moving. And so, that's sort of the beginnings of the inexplicable behavior. If it doesn't do it, it will fall on its face. Um, and, and so, either it has to essentially do what the human expects and you know get get injured that way or provide information saying look these additional preconditions that i have you are not aware of and then i need to provide that information so that sort of works as a uh, sort of a running example in in the background for part of the talk okay so explicability essentially from a, in, in a from a formal perspective essentially you are saying that uh, the robot now should find a plan that should be executable with respect to its own model of the world, but actually should be optimal according to the human's expectations of it. So it's a multi-model planning. In fact, much of what we'll be talking about would be planning with two models, you know, my own model as well as expectations that, I, that other person has on me. Okay, so I would want the, the plan that I'm making to be executable in my model, my AI agent's model, but it should be either optimal, actually at least close to optimal in the human's model. We will actually be looking at optimality up front, but, you know, um, but then we'll talk about how to relax. Okay, so just to give an example uh, before going into how you can do this, essentially this is a scenario, this is in, again the same fetch robot um, in, 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 a, in, in our uh, fifth floor uh, in, 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 at Arizona State University and it's going from one place to other, um, essentially sort of think of this as a uh, simulated uh, search and rescue kind of scenario where it needs to go from place to place and it has the model of the map of the environment up front. So this is actually a good place to notice that how do you expect, how does the robot know the human's expectations on it. Uh, for the first part of the talk I will focus on the uh, inference part then I will talk about how to actually get these models too but in some cases such as this at the beginning you do have the same model. So both the human and the robot have the same model of the environment. But then the robot actually goes, starts going around and it might actually find, since it is a simulated search and rescue scenario, uh, it might find that things have all fallen apart and there may have been some paths that actually have rubble so it can't go through them. In fact, that's exactly what happens here. And so in the demo that, that I'm going to show here, essentially there is supposed to be a shorter path um, that the human expects with respect to their um, um, map. But then we put this fake uh, obstacle here. And essentially what the robot has to do is if it is trying to be explicable, it needs to actually clear the rubble and then go through the short path. And as crazy as it might seem, if in fact somebody is waiting on the other particular other side of that and there is no other way of getting to them, you will have to do that. If that's what you are expected to do, you will wind up having to do it. So in this particular case, it actually, uh, the explicable behavior involved, doing something very inapt. for the robot which is you know taking a subroutine uh, of cleaning the path just so that it can pass through it. Uh, that's what happened here. There are other scenarios where again it, you know, there may be a similar kind of behaviors where you are essentially making sure that the path that you follow would be in conformance with what the human in the loop expects you to do. Okay, so now how do I do this as a planning problem? Normally, planners actually optimize the cost of the plan that they are synthesizing. Um, that now the robot is not only optimizing the cost of its plan, 
but it is also optimizing sort of the distance between its plan and the plan is expected according to the human's model. Okay, so that's basically, and then so sort of there is this additional uh, uh, regularization which sort of makes it go for plants that are closer to the human's expected model. Now, this distance can be done, of course, um, if you have the, the exact model of the human's expectations on you, um, then you can essentially compute the plan that the human would have expected you to do with respect to uh, as an optimal plan and then you can compute the distance between that and what the plan that you are generating are and use those distance measures actually to push yourself towards the plan that the humans would be expecting. So this is like our first idea. As it goes in these days, the very first idea that we had about four years back finally is seeing the light of the day as an extended abstract in this conference. So in fact, I will be standing with my poster sometime this evening uh, to show you uh, about this particular poster about how actually if you happen to have uh, the model directly, then you can use the distances to um, essentially push the robot towards the uh, robots towards the expected plan. Okay, that's the first idea. Actually, there's a better idea. Uh, if you don't have that particular model directly, so the previous one can be thought of as a model base. So you actually have the direct model that the human expects of the robot. You can do this model free way where you don't have to learn the model. You just have to learn the human's expectations directly. So that's the other possible way. So where we essentially, there is some work in um, <laughs> three years back, as a, two years back in ICRA 2017, we showed basically that uh, you can have um, uh, a labeling procedure that you learn which sort of shows uh, what sort of behaviors the humans uh, seem to like, what sort of behaviors humans don't seem to expect from the robot and then use that labeling procedure to essentially push the robot um, towards, during its search, push the robot towards generating plans that are closer uh, to what the human expects. Okay, so this basically in this case you don't learn the model, you just learn the human expectation directly from the, from the traces. Okay, so that also is possible. Um, now this is about conforming to the human's expectations. Now I want to say I don't want to actually conform to the expectations, it may be too costly. I want to essentially try to provide an explanation. Um, in the case of explanation essentially the idea is you want to Again, assuming that you have the access to the human model, now, as I said, in, in some cases such as the urban search and rescue, you do have the beginning models are the same, so you essentially have to look at how they drifted. Um, so you want to essentially give the changes to the human's model such that with respect to that new model, they would have seen that your behavior is actually optimal. Now there are two points here. One, of course, is here in this particular part, we're expecting that the humans have the inferential capacity to essentially realize that the optimal plan with these changes would be the plan that the robot is showing. Uh, we will talk about how to deal with inferential limitations a little later. Um, the second, of course, is there is a um, obvious uh, degenerate solution here, which is anytime somebody asks you, why did you do this? You say, take my head, put it on yours, then you'll understand why I'm doing this. So the idea is give the entire model, the robot says, you know, remove whatever you know about me, I'm going to give you this, you know, 15,000 line model of my uh, environment, just start using it right now. That would be essentially kind of going to uh, overload the humans. You don't want to give the entire model, you want to give the piece of the model that is enough for them to understand why you did what you did in this particular case. So that's important. So there is a degenerate solution. Uh, you know, explanations are not, you know, as, as computationally easy if you just can give your brain to other people, okay? So that's something that you keep in the back of your mind. Yeah. So again, in this particular case, if I had the video on, you would say that it just did not, dec it decided in this particular case not to remove the, uh, not to remove the, uh, the rubble, but instead take what is the, the best path for it given its new model because there is uh, rubble in the in the environment. And then it's yelling at the top of its voice saying, I'm doing this because this particular uh, um, path is blocked. Notice that many other paths may have been blocked too, but it's not talking about them. It's only talking about the one piece uh, of the model uh, that needs to be changed so that you would understand why it's doing the, the behavior it's doing. 
Okay, although that's the robot version, we also do this with respect to digital support systems. Um, obviously, it's not anywhere near as much fun watching a decision support system uh, as a slide, but essentially, in a you know a plan uh, planning decision support system, it can provide explanations behind why it gave the suggestions it gave in terms of how the plan should be going for the patient planner. So that's we do that too. Um, one other thing that I want to mention is. XAI has become all of a sudden hot topic, right? I mean, in fact, I, I just found out that there was a, um, a, a workshop here that I somehow missed uh, called Extra Mass. I somehow did not realize Extra Mass will be XAI. Uh, it looked like an extra thing that is added into our mass. Uh, but it turns out that every conference right now is looking at explanations. Uh, but much of the thing in explanations has been as a debugging tool for inscrutable representations. Okay, um, so most of the time those things wind up being pointing explanations. Essentially, okay, why do you think this is a dog? Look, look this particular piece of the picture that makes me uh, think this is a dog. Now, pointing explanations are the most primitive kinds of explanations. Civilization got us to a point where we don't have to point to things to explain. In fact, they are actually highly limited those of you who know adversarial examples, which are like uh, you know, all the talk of the town in basically deep learning right now, because these are highly overfitted systems which can be made to misclassify in lots and lots of different ways. So it turns out for those of you who don't know, so here's a school bus, you just add some imperceptible noise, you get this, which I assume you guys think is a school bus, but the machine will think is an ostrich. Now imagine you are asking the machine, explain to me why this is an ostrich. Point out which, which pixel made you look uh, that as an ostrich. That's the silliness of pointing explanations. When they work, they're fine. But in fact, explanations only work when we have some common vocabulary. There's this beautiful saying by Wittgenstein that even if a lion were to speak, you wouldn't understand. And that's what we are doing right now, essentially, because if you learn your own representations, uh, finding the only explanations you can provide would be pointing. And even if you don't care about these images, imagine why did you, I want to ask me, Rao, why did you wear this particular dress today? Or why did you do this particular travel option? I need to point to the space-time tube. Say, this thing, this thing, this thing made me do this. The civilization actually was to come up with a way of compactly representing these things as models and the pieces of the models. And so I'm sort of interested a lot more in explanations are actually critical for collaboration, but they're beyond just pointing. Um, and they will involve models. And furthermore, explanations are not soliloquy. Um, Teachers when, tend to explain uh, when students ask questions by talking to themselves. Uh, normally, the explanation is about understanding what the problem is in terms of the student's model of the world and then trying to make the changes to that as I was talking to yourself. And so, again, this model reconciliation approach that I'm talking about essentially avoids explanation being a solid art way. Um, and it also sort of is close to some of the theories in psychology about what explanations are supposed to be. For example, these will have contrastive property and they will also essentially notice that there are two different models with respect to which you are trying to provide explanations. And that's sort of a uh, thing to keep in mind. And so we in, in Ichikai 2017, two years back, we essentially had uh, this exp generation of explanations um, and a, a paper on that, and it, we looked at a variety of explanations. Remember, I said that there's always degenerate explanations, such as model plus explanation, which is giving my entire model to you, and that would be very easy to compute, but it's just too costly uh, in terms of comprehension for the human in the loop. And then it, there are other things, such as minimal complete explanation. Somebody asks you a question, you give the minimal change they have to do, such that they will say they'll agree with you. But then another little later, actually, there are other differences between your model and the human's model that you are aware of. And little later, that will come and bite you because the previous explanation will no longer hold after something more happens. And so, actually, you can't just go with minimal complete explanations. There is also minimally monotonic explanations where you essentially provide uh, the changes that need to be made such that given these two models, you will no longer come back to me with you know, uh, problems of the same type. 
And then, of course, you can also do approximations on these. Um, so these winds up being the different kinds of explanations uh, wind up being essentially changes in terms of these preconditions, add these preconditions, add these effects to your model. That's the deltas that we compute in our case. And uh, in particular, notice that when this guy, this poor guy fell off, um, it basically, my, I, I just say that all you need to do is to provide that when you walk, when you are uh, moving essentially, crouching it winds up being a precondition. That's the thing that you are saying. Okay. So those are the kind of uh, uh, things that you can compute. Um, the different types of models have, uh, the explanations have different kinds of theoretical properties, including completeness in the sense once that explanation is that patch is you know, added to the human's model, they will see that the plan is actually uh, optimal in that resulting model. And in terms of conciseness, is this the smallest amount of explanation that can you can provide in terms of the number of details? Monotonicity, will you keep changing your mind if I just add one extra problem later on, given the same uh, models on both our sides? And of course, finally, computability, how hard is it to compute? And the interesting thing, of course, is model path explanation, taking my brain and giving it to you is very cheap to compute. Okay, computing the smaller ones are actually harder. Computing the smaller explanations winds up being a meta search in the space of models, really. Okay, um, and and so in fact, so basically the search that we're looking at is this model space search where the the robot has a model MR, human has model um, uh, basically an expectation of the robot's model MRH, and you are essentially trying to go in the space of models, making changes, deltas to the model such that you essentially, the, what, the, the plan that's optimal with respect to the robot is also the plan that's optimal with respect to the change model. The difference between the MCE and MME winds up being which direction you travel. If you want the minimal change, you start from the human's model to the first point where essentially the robot's plan becomes optimal. If on the other hand, you want the robot, the minimally monotonic, uh, explanations, you start working from the robot's model until the last point where after this change on this path, the robot's plan will no longer be optimal. And, and so all these other points, it's optimal. And then this is the piece of change that you will need to provide. So that winds up being monotonic explanation. And meta search and the space of models is obviously costlier than just search for plans. Um, so it's not an easy, uh, computationally easy thing. But it turns out there are a variety of structural um, properties that we could use to improve this search. And there are a bunch of things that we talk about um, in the Ichikai paper. OK. So the other thing is to point out that this explicability and explanation, they are not completely different things. They can actually be traded off. They can be combined together. Um, in particular, in this search space, I can essentially go up to this model and then provide and, and be explicable with respect to this model. And then so this path would be explanation and, the, and then you will become conformant with respect to the rest of the uh, model. So you provide half the changes to the, uh, part of the changes to the human's model and then you be optimal with respect to uh, that modified one. Uh, so that's basically the trading explicability and explanation. Once again, this paper actually was presented as an extended abstract, uh, I believe, last year at AMAS, and it's going to be presented in Ichikai this year on how to combine the explicability and explanation um, in, in using this sort of a uh, search scenario. Um, the other interesting thing is I made it sound as if explicability and explanations are sort of outside of the search of the planning, search for the planning itself. But those of you who are from epistemic planning, and I know that AMAS is full of those people, uh, you could be thinking that, hey, you know, explanatory actions are actions too. And as you, and in fact, while you are doing the work, you start talking about the work that you're doing, that would be explanatory actions added to the causative actions. And that would be sort of a way you can generate plans that are self-explaining to some extent. And so in general, in, within planning community, epistemic planning has not caught on as much because it's much harder than even you know, uh, normal P-space completeness of the normal deterministic planning. But one uh, thing is that for our sort of scenarios, uh, in fact, the, the version of epistemic planning that we have can be compiled back into classical planning. So there is sort of a silver lining there. But this sort of tells you that, you know, getting explanations is exp having explanatory actions included in your behavior directly. 
Okay, uh, so that's something that you know that's available in archive. Um, one other thing is to essentially use these ideas to provide models um, for the robot that essentially allow it to project its intentions as it's basically doing either ex while it's doing execution, it can start adding additional. Uh, projection actions include which involve essentially these explanatory actions um, and then in fact in, in this start of a term uh, the, uh, in this start of a direction we have looked at uh, scenarios uh, in particular because there's communication involved and you can always do communication with respect to natural language and uh, natural modalities but we kind of for the fun of it looked at augmented reality uh, modalities using hololens or uh, you know even cheap brain computer interfaces, not the kind of things that Elon Musk is paying for neural link, but even the cheap ones that, you know. Uh, uh, so for example, this one essentially, this guy is wearing an emotive uh, interface and can essentially sort of put dips on particular blocks that he was going to work on and the robot essentially avoids, you know, getting into um, a conflict with them. So that's for the intention recognition part. Um, In the intention projection, the robot essentially can provide additional information to the human as to which pieces it's going to actually wind up using next in this particular block stacking sorts of scenarios. And there we wound up using uh, um, uh, HoloLens and uh, you know and the pinching motions etc of the HoloLens as the communication mediums. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, is which communication primitives are you going to use? You have to compute those. In, in, a, in a paper in IRAS 2018, we talk about How those are computed. So essentially, uh, the, the during the execution, once the plan has been provided, the, plan, the, the the robot can add additional explanatory actions on top of it, such that during the execution, uh, the human in the loop would understand where the robot is going. Um, so I don't know for some. Uh, oh, actually, this works here. So that's just to show that there is a video there, but I probably won't have too much. Um,
time to let you do but so essentially it, it can put additional uh, pointers that the human can see with the uh, hololens with respect to not just the reality but also what pieces that you know it's going to do this can be done of course with natural language too that's completely fine that's the kind of thing that we wind up doing here we're just adding additional things that were actually available okay so there are all sorts of holographic control panels Okay, one other thing that I want to get to now is, I kind of mentioned this, so we talk mostly about the inference problem. Coming from planning, that's the kind of thing that I get excited about. If you have these two models, how do you do planning? But the, and then I talked about the fact that in some cases, you do have the second model, the expectation model too. For example, you wound up starting from the same uh, uh, initial level. Um, but uh, even if in fact the robot doesn't know the model, so this is the thing that I mentioned that you started with the same model in the case of uh, urban search and rescue. But even if the robot doesn't have the same model, uh, a single model, it might think that you are, let's say, part of 15 different models. Okay, so there's a, a set of models that the human might have. And it turns out, I'll show you in a minute, that in fact, if you have these multiple models, you can use them as an incompletely specified model with possible preconditions and possible effects so that a single model winds up being, you know, corresponding to an exponential number of uh, candidate models. And use that to generate what I call conformant explanations, an explanation that will work for all the models that are possibly present. So that's also possible. And then finally, you might actually have to learn the model uh, from traces. And we have done some of that work too, but I want to say, in fact, there's some work that we presented here a couple of years back um, on, on uh, learning models from traces. There's a lot of work on learning uh, from planning models from traces. But here the difficulty is you're learning not what the humans are doing, but the human, what the humans expect the robot to be doing, which is a additional difficulty. And then finally, there may be shortcuts actually which involve model-free ways of learning this without actually having to learn MRH explicitly. Uh, you can learn um, what the humans, how the humans would label the behavior in terms of is it comprehensible or not. I already showed you model-free explicability earlier on uh, with the labeling. It turns out that even the explanations can be done in model-free way. Uh, there's a paper coming out in Hitchcock 2019 that I'll show you a little quickly. Uh, in terms of learning, the one point I want to make this picture is we tend to essentially assume there's this sort of a divide that there is the world where we people, in fact a lot of people now must too, will wind up having fully causal models um, that either are specified or you want to learn them from scratch. And then there is other world where the people are learning correlational models with no guarantees whatsoever. We can laugh at them, but on the other hand, really we want a sort of a bridging of the two worlds. And so in fact, we've been arguing that it's important for planning community to look at models that are partial, uh, partially causal or partially correlational. Uh, uh, in some work that we presented a couple of years back at Amas, um, we showed how uh, something like a word traces, word vector embeddings can be used to generate uh, models, um, uh, basically completely correlational models uh, that are actually more effective in doing recognition than uh, PDDL models that learn from the same data. It finds out the interesting thing there is that the word vector models essentially um, wind up having fewer parameters that you need to learn than the full PDDL model. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is, wanted to mention is the model free model reconciliation. So what winds up happening there is even if you don't have the human's model, you can essentially set up a labeling scheme where a trace as well as an explanatory action is given uh, and then you see whether or not the human's labeling changes. And from that you can learn what these explanatory actions wind up meaning to the humans uh, in the loop. And uh, so that winds up basically being a variation on the same sort of labeling procedure that I uh, explained to you, uh, that I mentioned to you a um, uh, few minutes back in terms of explicability. Except now, in addition to the trace, you also have the explanatory action that is being added. And so this is how the robot essentially figures out that if I say this, people seem to let me go. And so you learn the magic words in essence. So that's the way that can happen. And there's a paper that's coming out that explains that. 
So things are nice as long as we decide that we are human and so we know what humans want. Uh, but I have this problem that engineers deciding what uh, humans want is a bit of an oxymoron. Um, and so we really do need to have a, um, human subject studies. Uh, in fact, in, in all these areas, if you don't know what an IRB is, you are probably not doing the right research. You need to have an you know, institutional review board uh, and, and human subject studies. And I wind up working with my colleague, Nancy Cook, um, and in, in trying to both learn uh, from the human human um, studies and also to evaluate our own work um, that we have developed the algorithm. Uh, as an example, that is a, a simple example of that, there is a paper that, and in HRI this year that shows that, for example, this sort of urban research and rescue scenario, we set up a, a, a scenario where you had humans play both the commander and, 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 the, uh, and the robot. And, um, and, and then essentially these are you know, subjects that are um, that, that have nothing to do with our lab, that are that recruited, and, and then we, with, with, in, in with them, we are able to see, for example, that humans wind up kind of coming up with different kinds of explanations that are uh, similar to uh, the kinds of things that uh, we wind up doing in terms of um, MCE and MME, the model, uh, the minimally complete and minimally monotonic. Um, and then we also showed that, we also saw that when they provide explanations, um, when, when they show explicable behavior, the need for explanations winds up being less. Uh, these are obvious, this is what you expect to happen, but actually going through a systematic study to make sure that this is really happening is, is quite a, uh, an enterprise. Uh, so there's also another work that we basically showed that sometimes there are multiple explanations, multiple explanations of the same kind, even the same MCE, but there are multiple MCEs, some corresponding to preconditions, some corresponding to effect changes, and is there a preference uh, between the types of explanations people get? And in this particular case, actually, it turns out that people tend to like uh, um, explanations in terms of effects less, more than, uh, than preconditions. So this is the kind of things that we want doing with respect to this. So then I get to the basic setup being extended to multiple directions and there's like a huge number of them but I'll probably just you know kind of give you a sense of what what we have done in this. Um, we can provide model reconciliation in non-PDDL settings that I'll talk a little bit. Uh, we can provide um, we can connect the notions of explicability and explanation that we develop to other notions of interpretability that the AI community has looked at. There is a paper in the uh, ICAPS that sort of puts all of them in a nice little landscape. Um, we can, instead of essentially just directly providing an explanation, let the explanation activity be an interactive one. The human says, why didn't you do this particular plan? That would be called a foil in the explanation literature. And you can use those foils to provide explanation as to why you did do that. Um, and then, of course, you can use the same kind of foils to provide uh, unsolvability. Uh, why didn't I be, why am I not able to solve a particular problem? Um, and then, of course, uh, you can connect uh, you can deal with multiple human agents when you have multiple human agents it's sort of connected to having incomplete models you have multiple models uh, and then we tend to take them as uh, models with possible preconditions and effects and compute conformant explanations and finally once you do human <laughs> mental models you can use them for cooperation but you can also use them for essentially deception it's like it's the same tool. You can use it either which way. All technology is dual use. Intelligence is the ultimate dual use technology. So you will be able to misuse it too. So in fact, rather than wait for somebody else to do it, we can actually figure out how this can be done. And so we talk, we look at a paper in AAA 2019, how mental modeling can be used for obfuscation as well as for explicability. With the same exact setup, you can do both essentially. And then we also talked about the fact that lying, I mentioned that lying is about mental models. And you can use um, uh, the same model reconciliation to provide a notion of how people can lie. And whether or, and we did an interesting study as to whether or not people are willing to be told white lies by an AI agent. So those are things that we wound up doing. Um, 
so very quickly, uh, in the case of MDPs, the basic big thing that winds up being different is the in, in deterministic planning, plans and behavior are more or less connected directly. In MDPs, for example, you will have a policy different from a behavior. Are you explaining a behavior or a policy winds up being you know, an important issue? Um, in terms of different notions of interpretability, I talked about explicability. There are notions of predictability, legibility, and they're all essentially in sort of different um, ways of making the human in the loop understand what the robot is doing. In the case of legibility, you want to know where, what is the goal that robot has among these three goals. In the case of explicability, you are essentially expecting the robot to do a particular plan and you would be surprised if it didn't do it. In the case of predictability, you just want to know what would the next step be. And it turns out they are connected, but they're different in interesting ways. Uh, there's a nice paper in ICAPS uh, that's coming up, which sort of looks at these you know, connections, theoretical connections. And in fact, something that's ongoing here is we can talk about design for interpretability. You can develop uh, environments where the, the robots would be essentially forced to show legible behavior. That is the other part of the stabilization of the environment. Um, the other thing that I mentioned is uh, basically you can provide uh, um, the, you can provide the foils and uh, the, the general idea is that in the case of foils, actually there's a paper in Ichikai last year, which sort of shows that you can have models at different levels of abstraction and the foil, the question that the human asks allows you to localize their model in the abstraction hierarchy. Uh, there is an video that I won't show you um, and it turns out the same sort of foils can be used for unsolvability uh, there's a paper coming up the interesting thing in unsolvability turns out that the problem actually can't be solved in the current version for the robot so how does it explain why it can't be solved so the idea would be to find a relaxation of the problem and then show a landmark a series of landmarks that the agent has to go through in that relaxation for that relaxation to be solved and say that that landmark is not available and that winds up being an explanation uh, in that case. Um, in terms of having multiple models, so you can have, let's say, multiple versions of an action, and that winds up actually having models with, um, you know, uh, essentially uh, possible preconditions and effects. And we can reason in terms of the maximally and minimally relaxed models of that, and then provide conformant explanations, explanations that will hold for the entire set of models. There's a paper on that. Uh, 2018. That allows you, for example, by the way, to also deal with multiple agents with differing models. So here is a scenario where with the uh, planning decision aid, we can have a single interface, but you can also have private interfaces that wind up being useful in the humans, uh, in, in providing different experiences for the different people. Uh, in terms of trust, <laughs> trust essentially, there's a whole entire set of things that would be important there. There's a paper that we had uh, yesterday in the workshop, uh, in one of the trust workshops where we showed, if in fact the human wants the robot to show explicable behavior, should they keep on monitoring the robot to make it show explicable behavior or is there a way of essentially gaming the system? And in fact, we looked at a game theoretic formulation um, that gives you some interesting insights as to how much um, 
monitoring needs to be done. And as I mentioned, uh, there's a paper in AAA 2009. I'll, I'll leave this video here to show that essentially it's the same setting. In this case, in this particular site, the robot doesn't want Anaka to see what it's doing. So it actually tells her something to do so that her gaze would be averted. In the other case, it wants the, the human to see what it's doing. So it tells her something so that it actually the actions would be seen. So this is the equivalent of, equivalent of seeing, look that side, and then getting them to look at a different way. So it turns out that the same exact mechanisms that we have been looking at can be used for both obfuscation. and legibility. And then finally, can AI bots lie? As I mentioned, there's a paper in AI uh, 2019 that sort of shows this very interesting question of uh, model reconciliation can allow you to tell lies. You can essentially try to get the human's model to come not to the AI agent's model, but some other model that AI agent made up. And it's just as simple in terms of search. And the question would be, would you be happy with that? And of course, not surprisingly, when we did this, there was a, an article, uh, and because this goes into the narrative of AI is out to get us, and say, think Skynet, you know, the moment AI boss will start, uh, start learning. So, in summary, what I tried to do is to tell you that synthesizing explainable behaviors requires that AI agent, require, you know, mod, reason about both its model and the human's model of, it, of its capabilities. And then this can be used to provide explicable behavior as well as explanations. And there's a variety of extensions that are possible. It's a pretty dense talk. So I actually have a Cliff's Notes version of this, a two-page version that is in the proceeding, so you can look it up. I also want to mention that I have not really referred to any other work other than the group's work uh, in the entire talk. That's not because there's no other work after all. Uh, in fact, I found out, I had the pleasure of doing a course on human aware AI last year, uh, and there's a nice set of readings, a long a set of readings, not just our papers, but all sorts of other papers, including uh, various people in this room, including Manifest Group and other people's groups, uh, that might be of interest if you are interested in this uh, direction. Uh, and then finally, you know, it looks as if putting humans in the loop is too much of a pain. Um, you know, it kind of increases the problems rather than making it easier. In the good old days, we would put humans in the loop to cheat, but now you're putting humans in the loop to deal with the humans, and that's actually much harder. But then, as uh, that one you heard say, is essentially, I mean, so this is sort of like, why do we have humans in the loop? Uh, because it's there, like, make engineers' life much harder. But then, it's perhaps worth it because some of our best friends are engineers, are humans, um, because they're also engineers, but, uh, and so we want to deal with them. And I want to show you my students' pictures, and I want to end with the summary. Thank you. We have time. We have time for a couple of questions. Just two questions. Yes. Here, right here. Yes. No, speak up. Can you just choose one? <laughs> choose one. Yes. One. I'm serious. Okay. Yes. So, okay, I just use. Uh, and that is in your model of the uh, human aware planning, you define the robust model and the human's model. But if you are assuming the presence of a human model, which I think is a bit much of uh, an assumption, because you are assuming a uh, full model of the environment and everything, then why do you actually even require the robot to be there and the planning? And no, so first of all, you could you could have you could have uh, uh, so so I think the question is if the human has a model of the task, what's the robot doing? Uh, much of our work here, we looked at human as an observer, but our interest is actually to support teaming. In fact, there's some work that we are doing where the human and the robot will have joint plan. So that was in fact the very first part. Some of the previous papers in AMAS where we talked about how to get out of the human's way when the humans are doing their own work, etc are wind up being important. And, and so, in fact, doing explanations um, when both of them are working together. The collaboration is what I want really, not just observation. Although more of the examples here have been observation. Very nice. You have a question there? 
Yes. Yeah, there is a microphone just behind you. Thank you. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Great, great talk. Thank you very much. There is a lot of interest in cognitive science uh, in topics like extended cognition, uh, augmented cognition, and distributed cognition. Uh, and it seems to me that that sort of a natural framework in which you could put a lot of this work. Have you given some thought to that? I think certainly. I mean, this whole area falls in the rich intersection of many things. In fact, that course syllabus that I gave, I request that you take a look at it, not just because it's my course, but because we, I actually tried to get exactly at some of that. It's not about just my work, because I wanted to get the next generation of grad students ready. And so they, in fact, have uh, uh, papers from cognitive science, papers from human factors, uh, papers from psychology, of course, and how they have different uh, connections to the expl explainability. And of course, for me as an AI guy, I I'm interested in algorithms actually to generate these behaviors, not just make theories. So, but there, are, of course, the theories might very well come from some of the insights in the cognitive science. So we'll we'll take one more question. Yeah. Thanks very much for the great talk. Uh, I'll try to be as concise as possible and for the sake of time. So I'm wondering the cost term that you use to decide the cost of explanation of the difference between the new model mental model and the model of the agent. It is now formulated, if I don't understand it, in terms of the size of the change of the model. But it seems to me that some small changes in the model can be extremely difficult Understand. Yes, completely. I, so actually, I just to make it easier to see the examples there. I just talked about the size, but the in fact the Ichikai uh, a seventeen paper talks about cost. Cost sensitive planning is very much possible, and this is sort of connected also to this HRI abstract that I talked about. Different kinds of explanations uh, might also be in addition to having the same cost. Uh, might wind up being of different interest to the humans in the loop. So those are all definitely connected. It's very much part of them. Okay. Uh, let's thank Professor Subarao Kamapati for a great talk. Like I said, I'll be with a poster in the evening. Come and talk to me if you want. Great talk. Oh, thank you. Very, thank you. Very interesting. I'm not in the area of planning, but. <laughs>